We've seen tremendous global collaboration towards the elimination of lymphatic filariasis through mass drug administration and also through vector control. And this has resulted in a significant decrease in transmission intensity in many areas. And as a result, at least 18 previously endemic countries are now in the process of scaling down treatments uh, and also establishing that transmission has taken place. But there have also been some challenges. In order for an elimination program to be successful, we need to achieve the appropriate coverage and continuity in order to break that transmission, uh, in order to hit that transmission breakpoint. But what is that breakpoint and what is the most appropriate coverage? That's going to depend on local epidemiology and transmission dynamics. So we use transmission models in order to help us inform the best approach to eliminating LF, whether it's through combined MDA with vector control, what coverage is needed, and how many years it's needed. And this slide summarizes some of the results from the NTD modeling consortium, which were published last fall. The first result is that systematic non-adherence to MDA, either year after year, or between MDA and LLIN use, is going to significantly increase the time to elimination. The second point is that vector control, when used in combination with MDA, can have big effects on elimination and may be the only approach in areas with high endemicity. And then the third point that I want to touch on and what I'll talk about today is that heterogeneous transmission dynamics can also greatly influence the time to elimination. And this point is illustrated nicely in this graph where you can see the relationship between disease prevalence in humans and vector densities at different levels of bite aggregation. So that K is the parameter of aggregation such that a high K, as seen in the yellow line, corresponds to more homogeneous biting, and a low K, as seen in the blue line, corresponds to highly aggregated biting. And what's interesting here is that at more homogeneous um, biting, so the yellow line, you can see that you can have quite a high prevalence of disease associated with that biting rate. However, that breakpoint below which we will not see transmission is also quite high. In this graph, it's near 120. Conversely, in the blue line where we have aggregated biting, maybe we're not going to see such a high disease prevalence, but that threshold is very low and that's going to be hard to hit. Of course, it's going to be even more difficult to hit that threshold when we don't even know what it is in the first place. So looking at that figure, as a vector biologist, there are a number of research questions that immediately jump out at me. The first one is, what is K actually? Uh, and does it vary between neighboring villages? Because that would have significant impacts on how we you know, implement, implement, say, mass drug administration. We can't do village by village uh, a specific program. So this is going to be district wide. And does that, does that aggregation parameter change surrounding a control program? And are we assuming that aggregated biting is also associated with aggregated disease? And then furthermore, looking at that on a spatial scale, do we see you know, uh, breeding sites uh, close to areas with high biting density? And is that spatially correlated with um, you know, infection prevalence and intensity? So this study was done in East Sepik province of Papua New Guinea. There are five villages here near the Drykakir station. And two of these villages had moderate transmission, and the other three had relatively high transmission. And colleagues and I have been working in these communities for many years, measuring transmission dynamics surrounding the first MDA, which was in the 90s, and then 10 years later surrounding the uh, distribution of long-lasting insecticide-treated nets. So the methods for this study, we mapped all the households in these communities. We also mapped the breeding sites. We collected mosquitoes using the human landing catch method, and this was done we chose households uh, in each of four quadrants of each village every month, and we sampled for 36 months. During this time frame, we captured the distribution of bed nets. And then at the same time, we did community-wide surveys for filariasis antigen prevalence. And then we also collected uh, blood at night to test for microfilaria prevalence and to measure the intensity. So our questions were addressed using two approaches. The first was non-spatial modeling, where we calculated the heterogeneity parameter by fitting the negative binomial distribution to both the bite density data and the microfilaria density data for each village. And this was stratified uh, according to the distribution of LLINs. And then for the geospatial modeling, we modeled the bite data and infection data. So when I say infection data, that includes antigen prevalence, microfilaria prevalence, and microfilaria intensity. Um, this was modeled separately by generalized linear model. 
The fixed effects for this model included age, sex, and distance to breeding site, as well as LLIN presence. And then we also looked uh, to see whether there were seasonal trends in the biting densities or whether there was an impact of the actual time at night that the blood was collected, and these were found to be non-significant. And then we did, for the combined modeling, we produced a bite count de dependent spatial field, which we used to predict the distribution of the antigen and microfilaria prevalence and intensity, and to see how strongly these are correlated. So first I'll present the, the results um, just uh, in each of these villages, starting with the man biting rate. So in year one is the year immediately before the bed net distribution, and you can see in our five villages, we had biting densities, uh, mean ma nightly man biting rates up to about 50 bites per person per night, and that decreased significantly uh, in the year after nets were distributed, and we also saw lower biting densities in, in the third year. And then to, just to show you what the microfilaria prevalence was in these villages, um, you can see that in our high transmission villages, it's actually quite high, so nearly 40% were microfilaria positive. Um, and it, in those communities that, that would correspond with about 80% antigen prevalence. However, in the lower transmission villages, it was um, around 5% or less. And I've also overlaid the mean man biting rate. So you can see that in the village um, Yawatong, high biting was also associated with quite high disease prevalence. But we see a range of moderate biting here with various disease outcomes. Okay, to start, um, I'll present the non-spatial results. The graph on the left shows that calculation of the K parameter. Uh, the orange dots are the values before nets went out, and we see quite a bit of variation here between 0.5 and 1 in these neighboring villages, and these villages are, are just a few kilometers apart. But after nets went out, we saw a significant reduction in that parameter, and that's associated with an increase in heterogeneity. This was significant in four of these villages. The village that it, where it was reduced but not significant, in that village we also did not see a significant reduction in biting rate. Biting rate was low both before and after. And then to answer the question if, you know, are these villages that are characterized with heterogeneous biting, do they also have more aggregated disease patterns? That graph is on the right, uh, and I know it's quite difficult to see the scale here, but we have the, the man biting rate, man biting rate um, heterogeneity plotted on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, one thing you'll note is that this is uh, at least tenfold more heterogeneous, and that we see between 0.01 up to 0.05, whereas with the man biting rate, it's more between 0.5 um, up to 1. So there is a slightly positive correlation here, but it is very, very weak. And now I'll present the, the spatial results. So these are the fits from our hierarchical model. And um, across the five villages, what you'll notice is for the bite rate, there's definitely a hot spot there in Yawatong where we have very high um, nightly biting rates. And that cools off as you move both east and west. And then you can see the pattern for antigen prevalence, also some hot spots, but reaching up uh, to the sort of northwest in Penang. Uh, and similar patterns with microfilaria prevalence and microfilaria intensity with some very specific hot spots of microfilaria intensity. Now, there was, a sig there was significant dependence of all of these on that bite field. However, the strength was the greatest when we were looking at um, predicting antigen prevalence. So what it looks like here is that, is that there are different factors that um, are going to drive sort of the, the disease prevalence than there are factors that drive intensity within an individual. So to conclude, vector control will likely increase the heterogeneity and bite risk in a community, which would result in a lowered threshold biting rate required to break transmission. And maybe that's not a problem because the ultimate goal will be to, of course, reduce those biting rates. But we need to be aware if the interventions that we're distributing are also going to lower that threshold, we'd like to know what that threshold is and ensure that we're able to reach it. So next steps for us to follow up here is to take these village-specific values for microfilaria prevalence and the biting rates and the, um, and the aggregation parameter to really model what the timeline for elimination is and whether it's different um, between these villages. And then the second point is that aggregated biting is a relatively poor predictor of microfilaria intensity, but it's a better predictor of LF prevalence. Of course, there are other non-spatial factors that will govern intensity, such as strain fecundity or human immunity, 
And this result is also supported um, by some work of ours where we found that individuals in these communities that had very high microfilaria intensity actually had fewer haplotypes when we were looking at the, the, um, um, the genetic diversity within the microfilaria, fewer haplotypes than those that had the low density infections. Also pointing to human immunity or possibly strain fecundity. So I would like to acknowledge contributions from my colleagues on the NTD Modeling Consortium. Mike Irvine was involved in this modeling, as well as Deirdre Hollingsworth. James Kazura was the principal investigator of the filariasis study in Papua New Guinea. And I'd also like to thank my former group at the Papua New Guinea Institute of Medical Research. Thanks.